Hey everybody, my name is Lynn Hayes. Welcome back to my channel. This week we're going to be talking about the astrological influences coming up for the week of July 29th, ending around July 5th with the lunar eclipse. So there's a fair amount to talk about. Let's just get started. I do want to back up and talk a little bit about what's going on right now in the skies. In case you're new to my channel, you may not be aware that right now there's five planets that are traveling retrograde or that are appearing to travel retrograde in the sky. So obviously planets don't actually move backwards in the sky, but because we look at the planetary motion from our perspective on Earth, sometimes they appear to, to be moving backwards. When a planet moves backwards or appears to move backwards from our perspective, there, the energy of that planet, the symbolism and the influence of that planet tends to be, first of all, more personal, more pronounced. That planet's really getting our attention when it is retrograde. And also there tends to be a lot of looking back. It can be difficult to move forward. There's not a lot of energy for change and forward motion. The energy is more for looking back and revising the past and reimagining our past to try to create a more effective future. So right now, um, there are five planets retrograde. Between now and the middle of October, there's going to be as many as seven retrograde planets, which is a huge number. I looked back into my tables and I looked all the way back to the 1600s. I couldn't find any period where there were this many planets retrograde for this long a period of time. So this is very significant, I feel. You know, we're in a holding pattern now on planet Earth. It's going to be difficult to really move forward until a lot of things are changed. And this is, I feel, that really the lesson of this virus. That's, that's certainly the effect that it's having. We can't really do anything. We try to move forward and we keep going backwards. Which again, that's the symbolism of the retrogrades also sort of points that out. So here we are in at the end of June already. And we are kind of in the middle of all of this planetary soup. And we um, have a Jupiter-Pluto conjunction that's exact on June 30th. This is the second phase of this planetary cycle. It began in early April and it ends in November. But that's just one piece of a system that includes Jupiter, Saturn, and Pluto all traveling very closely together. The Saturn-Pluto conjunction was in the middle of January, which sort of began this whole thing. So Saturn being the planet of restriction, limitation, tests, challenges, conjunct Pluto, the planet of destruction and regeneration, a powerful combination. Now we have Jupiter, the planet of meaning, the planet of philosophy and religion, the planet of confidence and abundance, and the planet that expands who, who we think we are is conjunct Pluto. Again, creative destruction, death, rebirth, transformation, and the need to just sort of surrender. Under a Pluto influence, we really don't have very much control, I'm afraid. I like to always think we have control. I'm very big on creation, you know, creating a life. And when we have the, this kind of planetary dynamic, we are pretty much on pause, as I've said multiple times. So the Jupiter-Pluto conjunction occurs this week, but it also occurs in tandem with the goddess, the asteroid Pallas. Pallas Athena emerged from the head of Zeus. There was no romance that created this new being. There was no interaction. She's pure divine intelligence. And I can't help but think that the inclusion of Pallas in this cocktail of Jupiter and Pluto and Saturn is really helpful. Pallas can help us to see things more clearly. These planetary alignments, especially with Pluto, is, are, very, sorry, are very much about um, instincts and beliefs and uh, sort of cre you know, creation of our belief systems, what gives our life meaning, and how those things are changing. There can be a lot of reactions to that. 
especially right now because Mars has moved into Aries. So I want to come back to that, but first I want to finish with Pallas. So Pallas, the Pallas-Jupiter conjunction and Pallas-Pluto conjunctions began last March. So this is again like the second phase, but Pallas has been very close between Jupiter and Pluto, or as they sort of have been crossing back and forth. And I, I feel like there's an opportunity now to, for that to bring us an intelligent viewpoint and an intelligent way to be able to navigate these planetary challenges. So Mars just moved into Aries. Mars is going to retrograde while it's in Aries. And so Mars will actually not leave Aries until January when it moves into Taurus. Mars is at its most powerful in Aries. It's also right now at its closest point to Earth. It's at its perigee, and this makes Mars much stronger. Just like the supermoon appears very large in the sky and the lunar events when the moon is that close and our supermoons, the moon is much more powerful in its influence. Same thing with Mars. So Mars in Aries is very aggressive. So this whole time right now is pretty intense and it's important for us to sort of understand, I feel, these underlying energies because we don't want to walk into situations and start lighting fires everywhere that we can't put out. If we understand that, you know, it's like when you go into a forest and the forest is very dry, you want to be very careful not to light a fire that could create a whole forest fire. And that's really the situation that we're in right now with not only Mars and Aries, but then we have all this whole backdrop of a virus that's changing the way the world lives. This is bigger than we can imagine. So Mars is in Aries. Um, but also this week, we have a very nice conjunction of the Sun to Mercury. Now this is the second conjunction of the Sun to Mercury in the Mercury retrograde cycle. And when the sun aligns with Mercury, there's kind of a, a brilliant um, explosion of mental energy. Now, this can be overwhelming for some people. Traditional astrologers call this combust and casini and don't think it's a good thing. But for me, my observation is that when the sun is conjunct Mercury, there's more intelligence. Now, I hope so, because we need something to counteract all this Mars, which is just very reactive. Um, but the Sun conjunct Mercury is going to be pretty much in orb for this entire week. And during the same period, the Sun and Mercury will be interacting with Chiron and Uranus. So Chiron and Uranus are in a sextile to each other. Those two planets are very interesting in their interaction as far as the realm of healing goes. Chiron has to do with healing emotional wounds, the, you know, the, the bad feelings that we have from the past that we are still kind of holding on to that we can't really release, that we have trouble letting go of. And then Uranus is the planet of radical change and innovation and electromagnetic energy. So when Chiron and Uranus interact, especially in a positive way like this, a sextile, it's a very supportive alignment. There's an opportunity for real healing on an energetic level. A lot of times these old wounds, these old emotional triggers may not, we may not even, there may not be a story or there may not even be a feeling, but sometimes there's just kind of an unease. That's the energetic component that gets kind of stuck in the chakras and then the chakras can get blocked and we feel tight in the chest or we have digestive problems or we can't, you know, we can't really speak or we have a, a headache at the third eye. So the, the Chiron sextile to Uranus actually started back in September and it's going to continue for most of this year. So there's a lot of this sort of awakening and reemergence um, energetically that can happen this year, but right now with the sun and Mercury illuminating with the sun and bringing to our conscious, 
attention with Mercury, this is a really good week for releasing these old patterns. So I think that takes me to the eclipse, which is at the full moon on July 5th. The full moon, the moon is full in Capricorn. This lunar eclipse is called penumbral. It's not that strong from an astrological perspective. The lunar, so an eclipse happens when a lunation or a syzygy, as it's called, occurs within 15 degrees of the lunar nodes. And we've talked about this before, but if you have questions, just leave them in the comments. So in this lunar eclipse, the lunar nodes are at 29 degrees Gemini and Sagittarius along that axis. And the sun and moon are 15 degrees away in another sign in Capricorn and Cancer. So when a conjunction is in two different signs, it really weakens that conjunction. Conjunctions are stronger when the two planetary bodies or influences are in the same sign. So in any case, we have the lunar nodes pretty far apart from the moon and the sun and in different signs. So that's it, not going to have the intensity that the eclipse at the solar eclipse or at the summer solstice had, for example, two weeks ago. But still, it's an eclipse, and it is the full moon in Capricorn, where the Capricorn moon is opposite the Cancerian sun. So we're looking at this balance here between cancer, our emotions, our feelings, how we take care of our tribe, our family, what we feel for the world, you know, the, the pain and the anguish that we feel for what the world is suffering. And under the Capricorn full moon, we have to learn how to balance that with the Capricornian nature, which is more about, we can't save the whole world. What are we going to do right now? What's practical? What's, you know, what's really needed for this time? So that's the, that's about all I have to say for this week. I hope you find this video helpful. If you do, please be sure to subscribe. That helps the channel. Give it a thumbs up, click the notification bell, and I'll see you again here next week. Thanks so much. Bye.